uh, without further ado, I give the time to you. Well, welcome everyone to the Executive Lecture Series. We have the wonderful opportunity to meet and talk with Pam Gunnell. Now, Pam Gunnell is SPHR, is an experienced HR practitioner with over 25 years experience. She began her HR career with Morton before the Automotive Safety Division was sold to AutoLeague. Her path then progressed from file clerk to office manager to HR generalist, to production supervisor, to HR manager, to corporate benefits manager slash director. After more than a dozen years in the automotive industry, Pam owns Gunnell HR Consulting Incorporated and has worked in the biotech, consulting, accounting, banking, healthcare, mining, and engineering industries. Her clients include Utah, SHRM, Mountain American Credit Union, Human <laughs> Resources, uh, Sun Healthcare, um, <clears throat> What's Working Well, Top View, Department of Works, Workforce Services, excuse me, West Host, and more. One of her favorite clients was Rio Tinto. After almost a year of coaxing, she became a full-time employee for them and did global HR project and implementation work for them for over six years. Pam is currently the regional HR manager for IMDS. Pam is a true-blooded Aggie, a former Aggieette, if I'm saying that correctly, <laughs> who later earned her MBA. Her husband, two daughters, her father, two brothers, and a sister are all alumni. Her great-grandfather also attended USU, although it would have been in the late 1800s or early 1900s when Grandfather Romero attended classes of, as at what was then called the Agricultural College of Utah. She's proud to be a former Aggieette and enjoys teaching the HR Capstone course um, as an adjunct professor. Sherman positions held include member of the State Council for several years, Utah's HR News Magazine Editor, Bridgerland Chapter President, and Regional HR Games Judge. Pam is married to Nolan Gunnell, a local investment broker and branch manager who frequently guest lectures at USU in the finance and econ classes. They are the parents of four children and live on the family farm in Mount Sterling with their 14-year-old daughter. So just for your information, Pam's LinkedIn statistics as of Tuesday afternoon were 13 million 583,598 connections. <laughs> She's a very well person. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Pam Gunnell. So let's give a round Thank you, Thomas. Can you hear me okay? Uh, no, is your mic on? I don't know. Do I have to do something to it? Okay, that's the biggest challenge so far. I'm not a dynamic presenter. Uh, I'm very honored, very humbled to be here today. Uh, I do occasionally get asked to speak at things and I kind of have to remind them that's not my strength. But when Lynn Pettit called me last probably spring and I was a little hesitant, he said, it's okay. We just want to know about your real life experiences. And I says, I have lots of those. So I can come do that. I just don't expect anything really fancy otherwise. So I hope you'll at least get some learning, some laughs, and we'll uh, save some time at the end for some Q&A. So if there's something you want to know, be thinking ahead. You can ask me at any time, or there'll be time at the end. So I did want to, just because of my personality base, I like to be organized and kind of make things line up. And I wanted kind of a theme. You know, I'm a girl. I kind of wanted to color code and, you know, accessorize. So I was brainstorming. and. My kids are all grown up except for the 14-year-old. And so I said, OK, what's kind of catchy? What's trendy right now? Give me a theme. What are people talking about? Not, give me something to work with. You know what she came up with? Fries before guys? What does that even mean? <laughs> I said, no, OK, let's try another one. What, what's another one? What does the fox say? <laughs> OK, I do know what she was talking about there, but I'm not making a video or anything. so. We're not going to go where the fox goes, I guess, on that. So we're back to no theme. This is an untitled lecture. 
uh, happy to give advice, share some cliches, and just some real life stuff. We'll start with a slide. Anger management is very important in HR because you very often are diffusing situations. So, how do you handle anger? <laughs> I don't know if that really fits in here, but I just really like that one. So I try to usually use that wherever I go. A um, couple of tips and advice about what not to do in HR. And I don't think I typed them up, so I'll have to read these. When you submit a resume, don't forget to put your full name, your phone number, and your uh, email address. Believe it or not, I have seen resumes come through that are missing those things. Do not add to your resume great attention to detail and spell one of the words wrong. I see that really often, okay? That's a bad one. Do not sit in the interview with gum in your mouth at all because guess what happens? You end up blowing bubbles. <laughs> Sooner or later, people that think they're just keeping it there for, I don't know, keep your mouth from getting dry or whatever, they start blowing bubbles. It happens all the time. Do not forget to fix the hole in the crotch of your pants before you sit across from me and I see more than I need to see. <laughs> Do not give the interview, interviewer TMI, too much information. I really don't want to know about your overactive bladder or your sex life. And yes, people have shared these stories with me before. Another basic employee, do not, do not go and win the bowling trophy that pictures you on the front page of the local newspaper when you are out with carpal tunnel for that same hand. That does get you fired. And do not accidentally hit forward to all when you get uh, personal jokes on your email work account. I've seen that happen way too many times. So being in HR, you need to have some analytical skills. So I'm going to give you a test. You up for that? Pretty simple. How do you put a giraffe into the refrigerator? Somebody want to take a guess? You open the door and put the giraffe in. Oh, I need to go back to my answers over here. Whoops. Somewhere over here is the exact wording answers. Or not. Okay, anyway, that is correct. Open the refrigerator, put in the giraffe, close the door. Sorry for that. Whoops. How do you put an elephant into the refrigerator? You open the door, open. You take out the giraffe, you put in the elephant, you close the door. Did you guys all hear that? <laughs> you guys are a very smart group. Open the door, take out the giraffe, put in the elephant, close the door. This tests your abilities to think through the repercussions of your previous action. Most people say, open the refrigerator, put in the elephant, and close it. So, Third question, the Lion King is hosting the annual animal conference. All the animals come but one. Which animal does not attend? The elephant is in the refrigerator. This tests your memory. Okay, one more chance. You guys are three for three, though. I'm very impressed. There's a river you have to cross, but there's crocodiles. You don't have a boat. Who knows how to manage it? Now we'll take this one. There you go. <laughs> Jump into the river, swim across. All the crocodiles are at the animal conference. And that is what you need to know in HR, right? I should not be throwing papers all over here. Okay, back to business. I wanted to make sure you learned something today. Does anybody know what that word means? It's my new favorite word because my boss called me on Monday. He says, Pam, I have a word for you. I said, excuse me? He said, I have a word for you. 
I said, do you want to have a word with me? I was a little bit confused. He said, no, I found this word. It means friendly to strangers. He found this word and he liked it so much and it made him think of me, so he sent me the word. <laughs> this is also something that's very important um, in human resources, is that you can be friendly to strangers. Those strangers then become your friends. Your friends become your network, so your strangers are your potential network. Everybody's part of your network. If you're not friendly to them, that's not a good link in your network. Um, it's a Greek word, and the X-E-N-O-S part means strangers, and the whole word in the English Oxford Dictionary means hospitable. So, Can you pronounce it for us? Oh, xenodochial. Xenodochial. If I ask you at the end, will you be able to remember the word? Xenodochial, friendly to strangers. So when you leave and they say, did you learn anything? You pretty much have to say yes now, okay? means I was successful. Um, this is not used just towards people as a personality trait. It also can be used towards a software system. So we're used to saying, I want this applicant tracking system to be user friendly or GUI, GUI, graphic user interface. You can now just say I need it to be xenodochial. Okay. And let's see what we have next. A huge part of my career when I was in the manufacturing industry was investigations and terminations. The main key word of advice there, document, document, document. So I was raised through that era when we had the Franklin Day planners and every day had its own little pages and you would mark down, talk to so-and-so, this date, this time. I even put the duration like from 10 to 1045. These are the topics we covered, or whatever kind of notes. Kept copious notes. Um, that could be good, it could be bad. Because I was in a situation that was quite litigious, or a lot of lawsuits, or potential lawsuits, it was very valuable. I find now that I'm working more with engineers in a different industry, it doesn't really matter. They don't really need it all, so I've had to really tone down this natural um, habit that's now formed to, to take copious notes. It would have been good if I would have had that as a student. I actually didn't back then. Oh, I'm not there yet. Um, a couple of examples of some investigations or terminations uh, that have happened that I thought you might find interesting. When I was still a non-exempt employee relations type person, kind of a, the office manager, ran the forms, opened the mails, did some filing, the basic miscellaneous stuff, helped get the postings ready. Uh, we had a new boss come in, and he found out that there was allegedly on swing shift a group of people in manufacturing that would leave early every other Friday with their supervisor's approval and hit the local hot tub, I believe it was Crystal Hot Springs. And the supervisor would keep them on the clock, he would manually keep their badges, and then when it was time to clock out, he would clock him or his designee, would clock everybody out, and then they would all go have a, a kegger and a hot tub party uh, every other week. <laughs> so we needed to do an investigation. So we had to plan the investigation. Who are the parties? How are we going to handle it? Well, the first thing you do not do is bring in the people one at a time because the first time the first one leaves the office, how long, how many seconds before everybody else knows what's going on? And can you say collaboration of <laughs> stories, corroboration? Um, so we basically made sure we had enough people and got all five people who we understood were involved to be interviewed at the same time in five different rooms. So there could act be absolutely no talking about what are we going to say, what's our story, how are we going to stick to it. So that is basically how I ended up getting promoted from non-exempt to exempt. I had um, finished my bachelor's degree but had not been promoted, but because they put me in exempt position, had me doing exempt work and then terminations, um, my boss was able to justify to his boss, well, you've got to make her exempt now. So that's how I got my first big promotion. Um, what happened with the five individuals? Four out of the five said, I don't know what you're talking about. It's never happened. I don't socialize with those people. Well, I kind of know them. Well, yeah, sometimes after work we've all got together and they got all these different stories about how 
I don't know what you're talking about. It couldn't have happened. The person that I was talking to spilled the beans, <laughs> sang like a canary, gave me names, dates, phone numbers, everything. And so again, that really helped me. Um, I tried to use that information to save the employee's job because they cooperated, right? Fire everybody else, but this one, we need to throw them a bone. They helped us out. The attorney would not hear of that. That would have been different treatment. So they lost their job, just the same as everybody else. But, um, and I felt bad about that, but they, they did wrong. They knew they did wrong. And they eventually helped to solve that case. Another situation, uh, we had a manager that went through an ugly divorce and all of his employees were very aware of it because he talked quite a bit about it. Again, TMI. And he ended up needing to move. And so he thought he was pretty smart. He had a whole crew of people that worked for him across three different shifts. He just came back on swing shift and said with his van, his, his ex-wife's minivan, and said, hey, how many people can I fit in the van? I need some help moving. While they were on the clock, gathered up as many as he could fit in his van, drove them to a location. They carried everything out, put it in the moving van. He drove them back to work. Did not even think anything of it. Had no idea that that was so terribly wrong. Needless to say, there was, there was uh, some disciplinary action there as well. I can't remember if he lost his job over it or just got demoted, but uh, did not think through the repercussions. He should have taken the test with the giraffe and the elephant, right? Should have been thinking about that one. Then there was the uh, whole department that saw nothing wrong with sending a lot of sexual-based emails, jokes, stories, and pictures just amongst themselves because they were all in the same department and nobody was offended because that was their culture and so it was just fine, right? It was not unwelcome or unwanted conduct. They all just loved it and thought it was great until, what did I tell you what not to do? Do not hit forward to all employees. That's what busted up that case. So we got IT involved and a few of us HR people spent several days pouring through an extreme amount, a very long history of uh, various degrees of offensive material. A lot of stuff was just jokes, but it was on work time with work equipment and it was inappropriate to the workplace. And the whole department was fired. Um, I guess I can admit it was the payroll department, which is a very bad group to lose them all at once. <laughs> my boss, my boss was the VP of HR and he came to me and said, would you be willing to run the payroll department? I need, obviously, you know, I'm losing a payroll manager. And I said, mm, the problem is I'm currently the benefits manager. And the way we have the system set up, the payroll system is this checks and balance. This side can only see this and this side can see this and nobody gets to cross over. And so which side are you going to put me on? And, and you don't really expect me to do both, right? And am I supposed to train somebody? And I threw a whole bunch of stuff up at him and actually got him to back off. I said, let's see what your other options are or else I could have had a little change in my career there too. But I, I did not want to be a payroll manager. Okay, not my idea of fun. And then there was the time uh, somebody came in. A lot of stuff happens on swing shift, just so you know. Some of the best stories I have were swing shift, where people graffiti really nasty things on the machines and stuff, and then you're supposed to come in the next day and figure it all out. Nobody's even there, and you recreate it. Um, somebody was out on the shipping dock, swing shift, and we get a phone call. I was actually still at work. You need to come here right now. I'm like, what is it? I can't say, but get here right now. So I grab my little safety shoes and my hat and smock and glasses, and I go through the plant, and I get out to the safety dock or the shipping dock. There was a not-so-nice magazine, a little pornographic thing, and so okay, <laughs> let's remove it. Are there anything? Is there anything else? And he was trying to keep it really low key. And we found an intercompany envelope to slide it in to remove it, and couldn't find anything else. Looked through the stuff, but it was just in a drawer. Somebody had stored it in the drawer in the bottom drawer to come back to. Apparently, that's one more of those do not do kinds of things. So these are the kinds of things we do investigations on. Uh, there was the termination for time card fraud. 
because we had cameras at the location and we did have literal badges with pictures that you do clock in and out. This person had clocked in for the day, had gone into her work area, which was a cubicle, had left the area with her purse and an umbrella but did not clock out and then came back about an hour and a half later and bypassed the little clock in machine because we had it on the camera and we know that. And then later on when she was confronted because someone had looked for her during this time frame, she denied it. So we terminated her for time card fraud. She came back and countersued us. She said it was wrongful termination. She said she was denied due process. Now if you're HR majors, is that an HR law? Is due process guaranteed? No one ever told her that. That was her big thing. She was denied due process. Then she threw in a little libel and slander. We didn't tell anybody anything. I was just, she just threw everything she could. There was the emotional infliction of pain and anguish that we did to her. On and on and on. Well, the first step of the process uh, was the unemployment hearing. So uh, the security guard brought the footage. And we were very confident and very prepared to show the ALJ, the administrative law judge, our proof that we knew for a fact she was coming and going. Uh, we knew she had done it in the past, but we felt like we only needed to prove the one time really strong incident because it was such a uh, long length of time and it was documented so well. Well, something happened with the way they recorded the video to, from the cameras and the little time clocks didn't match up, like from the different, yeah. Guess what, the ALJ decided we weren't very credible at that point. We actually lost the unemployment hearing which I hate because I had a really good record of winning those. And um, the judges, they can kind of do what they want. There's some guidelines, but they get to use their own judgment as well. Uh, that did go on, even though we lost the unemployment and let that go. Um, it took over three years before all the aspects of her charges were dismissed against us. She, she sued not only the company, she sued the company's attorney, the HR manager, the HR supervisor, her manager, the security guard who was there that walked her out. She named all these people as individuals in the lawsuit, meaning we could, if we lost, we could have to pay lots of money. The way that our company chose to handle that is saying, we would like our external attorneys that we will hire to take care of everybody, or else each one of us would have had to have come forward with our own attorney and all the attorneys would have been almost like fighting against each other and blaming each other. They said, no, we need to be very united. We will have one uh, attorney firm out of Salt Lake to represent all of us. If you will sign here, we will agree to pay all those charges. Anything we did acting in the scope of our employment, those are key words, you will be fully supported for. You cannot be punished for, the company will support you. Now, if you did anything illegal or stupid outside that, that's not covered. So we gladly signed on and as a group went through this very painful process of knowing you're being sued, knowing uh, actually being served papers. They served improperly by doing it kind of as a group at work, leaving them at the front desk, I believe. And our attorney called and said, now you can refuse that and make them serve it properly just to kind of be stubborn and difficult and make it. However, that means they will approach you in front of other people and you know you, you have to go through it even more personally do you want that and I said no that's just fine I'll take the one from the front desk with my name on it that's just fine so um, our attorneys had different strategies back and forth with her attorney uh, saying okay summary to dismiss this take this part off and they just kind of hacked it down smaller and smaller one piece at a time until um, after three years three and a half years it was finally gone away but during that time uh, we were able to have this person undergo a deposition. Has anyone here sat through a deposition? It's not something I would recommend. I was very glad I didn't have to do it because her attorney did not file papers to do it against all of us as witnesses. Um, what happened is this girl had to come to what was in her attorney's law room, but we, all, all the people named in the lawsuit got to be there, plus our external attorneys. So we're all lined up around this big conference table. Her, her attorney, and her parents were, were with her. She sat in the hot seat for, ended up being four or five hours, in which our attorney was able to just grill her repeatedly. What medications are you on? Why are you on this medication? So you admit you have depression. So you admit that you, you don't always think clearly. And tr always trying to dig at something. 
And then a few minutes later, they re-ask the question from a different angle to try to get them to kind of trip themselves up. You've seen TV shows, right, and how they play the games. Just so you know, because she opened it up that way, they were able to ask her things about her relationships, her sex life. Nothing was taboo if they could say, no, this affects your emotional um, state of mind, your frame of mind, while this and this and this were going on. And that's why I say it was such an ugly, ugly experience, is because there was no privacy, no humane treatment. It was basically, we are here to break you down and destroy you. And that's what sometimes these attorneys have to do. So don't sign up for that one. Um, other interesting times, um, interesting is a little soft of a word, is when we have to do reductions in forces. Okay, I don't really mind terminating somebody when they've clearly done something wrong and you know 100% sure that they did it. It's not just hearsay, it's not you think, but you know, and generally at that point they will admit it. And then it's like, I'm sorry, these are the rules, you've signed the handbook, you understood, you still did it. You know, my hands are tied is pretty much my story at that point. These are the consequences. And I can sign off the termination, look them in the eye, send them home and not lose too much sleep, okay? Maybe a little bit, because I always feel bad. But when you have to do layoffs, and you've sat through the meetings as you need to decide who's going to get the ax, who's not going to be able to keep their job, and you see there's a lot of really good people that are just, we just don't have enough jobs for them all. That's when it's really hard. That's when your heart feels like, why am I in HR? I don't really like this so much anymore, right? That's the mean guy thing. One of the most um, interesting experiences was a production supervisor as we had the meeting with him and told him he was no longer needed and proceeded to try to tell him what his rights were, what his continuation of benefits would be, what arrangements we would make to collect company property, you know, in a very humane manner. We're trying to get this. He had enough. He stood up. He started cussing. Um, as we're following him as he's starting to walk and I says, well, we, we'll need to, to collect your company property, you know, because he's not getting away from me just because he's throwing a fit, right? I still have my job to do. So he has this badge on. He whips his badge off. He throws it to the floor. Do you can have this. And he has a smock with Velcro and he rips the Velcro and pulls it off and throws it down and just stomping down the hall by this point. And we're following him because he's a loose cannon. What are you going to do? He keeps going. He gets a little bit further and he's yelling to people, don't trust him, you can't believe him. Look at what happens, you give your life to this company, on and on. It's just terribly embarrassing and you just keep following him. Luckily, he's heading toward the door, which is where you want him to go. You're hoping he has his car keys, not in this thing that he fell, but you know, you're hoping everything's fine, right? He gets uh, to the lunchroom and he, of course, has to go across the whole lunchroom, which has people in it. He is now untying his safety boots, his still toes, pulling them off, continuing walking, throwing it across the room. It slides and does the same thing with his next one, goes across the room, slide, all the way out to the door and he's slamming the door. It's a glass door that doesn't really slam because, you know, they're controlled and he's trying to slam the door. At this point, we're trying not to laugh, but you can see how emotional it is when you're dealing with people's jobs, their paychecks, their benefits. And, uh, you know, we, we still felt bad for him, but he kind of put on quite a show for us, too. And I talked, uh, I don't think we're really going to talk about unemployment hearings. However, in Utah, every state can be a little bit different. In Utah, there's three things you have to prove if you go to an unemployment hearing. This is critical. A lot of people don't know this. You have to prove that the employee that you let go had knowledge of what was right and wrong, they had culpability, meaning there's like a financial damage to the company, there's a cause and effect, something bad actually happens, and they had control over their behavior. So if you just kind of keep that in the back of your mind, one day you'll say, I know there's something I have to know, and then you'll go online and look it up, right? Let's talk unions. Now let's not talk unions. <laughs> I could give you just a couple of stories of uh, union organizing drive things and st other stories I was told, um, kind of hearsay, but employees who had lived in Detroit in the automotive industry saw car tires being flattened, windows 
being broken all in the sake of unions. So I say let's not talk unions, but that is the one time where employees have to pay money to go to management asking just to be treated fairly. So would it not make more sense if we treat them fairly up front and they don't have to go pay the money to request that? Um, as mentioned previously, I teach the HR capstone course. It's just this one semester. It's been just great. It's fun. One of the main things I'm teaching the students or hoping that they're learning <laughs> is to examine what their resources are. It's never just you alone. I have to figure this out. I have to make up an answer. That's one of the biggest mistakes you can make in HR is to continually reinvent the wheel. That wheel has been invented so many times in so many varieties and sizes and colors and flavors. If you need a form, if you need a template, if you need to solve a problem, most likely somebody's already have very similar need or request. And so um, these are actually slides from another thing I gave. I'm going to flash through them fairly quickly. So locally, you've got chambers of commerce, you've got your networking, you've got universities and technology centers, uh, you've got SHRM groups, you've got staffing companies, you've got consultants, Department of Workforce Services, um, religious employment agencies, benefit brokers, you've got social media, you can use interns, resources for help. Survey Monkey, if you were doing something specific to surveys, you've got libraries. You've got the internet. I mean, what can you not find on Google, YouTube? There's even full college courses online you can take for free, even not registering. You can just pull up the notes uh, from multiple places. And that is not an exhaustive list. You've got so many resources. Your government has resources, lots of websites, lots of literature, pamphlets you can get from government, which answers most of your compliance or your audit type questions. Uh, that's just a couple of examples of what some of their things have. You've got LinkedIn where you not only can just connect to people, but you join groups that have similar interests that ask the kinds of questions. I've posted questions on LinkedIn. One day I joined a payroll group because I had a specific question, posted my question, watched it for a couple days till I got some answers and then deleted the group because I didn't care anymore, but I just needed to tap into their knowledge. So. Um, I had a couple more words of advice, and then we can do um, some questions and answers. So HR is all about people, but do not, this is one more do not, do not get caught up being the company cruise director, okay? Very important. You've got better things to do. And this quote is often accredited to Mother Teresa, and it's actually Thomas L. Garthwaite who said, People may not remember exactly what you did or what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. I kind of think that ties back into being xenodochial. So questions? Al. My advice for those just starting out into HR, I can't tell you how to find the first job, but you do need to be willing to not start at the highest. You need to be willing to start, like when I went to the first interview um, at Auto Leave, and it was actually a production interview, and I kind of lucked out when the guy said, well, we could really use you in the office. You know, you need to be willing to get into the company and learn everything you can about the company. You need to be very flexible. If you're asked to be a payroll person, which I got, I told you I avoided that one, a manufacturing person, can you help us out here or here? I'd say great, do it, it's, it's more experience. Everything you can add or learn to your um, toolkit is good. If you're the only person that knows how to do pivot tables or PowerPoint, you become very, very valuable. Um, everybody now wants to be your friend because especially if you're one of these xenodochial type people, it's very nice then they know they can come and ask you, help me with this, or at least show me how to do this. So uh, enlarge your toolkit, network, take opportunities as they come. That's kind of my initial to get you started. More questions? Please. How important is industry selection when considering a first job in HR? Very good question. How important is industry selection in selecting a job in HR? 
It can be very important if you have very clear goals. For example, if you know you want to see the world, if you want a global career, you need to go to a big global company. I worked for Rio Tinto, the mining company that owns Kennecott Copper. I worked there for six years. Um, had I started my career there, things probably would have been very different because you have a lot of global um, opportunities. And so if I knew that was a path I wanted to take, I would have targeted a company in that industry. However, the mining industry is very cyclical. It's typically been like seven years of, you know, feast and famine kind of stuff. Um, so you'd have to decide if you have a tolerance for that as well, or if you can be in a specialized enough job that would protect you or buffer you from those kinds of problems. If you choose, say, a restaurant type business, maybe not as much in HR, but overall, are you willing to work the kind of hours that are busiest for those places? Do you want to work the nights and weekends that entertainment or service uh, industries may require. You know, do you know you want a nine to five office job? You need to look for those kinds of industries. When you say how important, I guess it means salary wise, opportunity wise. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. So you need to determine what's most important to you, who provides it, and how are you going to get there? Fair enough? So, Pam, you've moved across several industries. Yes. Has that been a difficult transition? Or do you find that once you're in HR, you can adapt pretty well? My experience is HR carries across the industries extremely well. Um, short answer. <laughs> you do need to make sure you take the effort to find out as much as you can about the company and the industry that you join. Um, I was on a phone call very early in my days with Rio Tinto, and we were talking about, I can't remember, it was a, a big conference call, and somebody was mentioning BHP, and I honestly did not know what they were talking about. <laughs> it happens to be the largest mining company in the world, and Rio Tinto was then either number two or number three. Um, luckily, I did not show my ignorance, but you can imagine how appalled I personally was that that is something I should have known. So don't ever, I mean, I didn't, nobody gave me up, nobody else really knew, but uh, it could have been a catastrophe. I just would have looked so stupid. Thomas. Um, I noticed on your profile that you're a member of, I guess it's called US TAG. On my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> Has anyone heard of ISO, the International Standards Organization? Raise your hand if you have, because I'm not seeing not too many. I like to use the example that, I'm going to back up before I answer the question. If I decided I wanted to build mattresses, I'm going to start my own company because I have real good ideas about what's the perfect mattress. So I just go out and I start creating mattresses and I'm like, I want one about this big that would fit me and, and let's make one that's a little bit bigger for this person and let's make another one. Are people going to buy my assortment of mattresses? Why not? They're not going to have frames, sheets, comforters because there's no standard, right? So. Along the line, in different industries, there has to be standards where people agree. These are at least the definitions. This is what we all agree to. So the ISO um, has many branches and arms that controls different things. The HR, the SHRM group, had said, we want to be part of that because when we talk about our turnover and somebody in Europe talks about their turnover, they may be using a different formula. Okay, they might be saying before this or after this or this time of the month or it could, there could be any kind of differences, right? And so um, I was approached to be part of this global team. Actually, I was on the U.S. team that then fed up into a global team. And I went to a couple meetings in Las Vegas where you sit down and you talk about what are we going to accomplish? How are we going to do that? Somebody else is already working on this. What are we going to work on? And it was very fascinating initially. Um, after a year, I actually got out of it because, you know what, I saw no progress. I said, this is a waste of my time. It's a good goal. And you guys that like to just sit and talk, that's great for you. Um, I learned a lot. I, got some, I have some big binders full of information and some directions that somebody else has already decided that they're probably going to go. But the team itself seemed to be a lot more of just, I don't know, a resume patter. Patter? Yeah, that's like a patter resume. Um, 
So I, it, I did that for a year. It was a good experience, but I had enough. Yes? Um, as a woman in business, do you feel like you've broken through the glass ceiling? Well, that makes me feel like you think I'm really important or something. <laughs> I'm just a regular person. <laughs> I don't feel like I've broken anybody's ceilings. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I do think it's still more of a male-oriented world in business. I don't feel like I've personally been mistreated. Um, I do think with the difference in management styles, it may be stereotypical, but I fit that the woman's maybe a lot more softer in the management style. Still a problem solver, but a softer approach. Um, that actually sometimes does hurt you if your higher management wants somebody that's just quick and you take care of it fast, don't think about it, you know, ask questions later. Um, but it's not 100% because I'm a woman, it's, it's a style. Um, the biggest, the only concern I guess I'd really have on that topic is you don't really ever fit in the boys club if they go, I mean some girls go golfing, I don't personally choose to do so. Um, a group of guys at one of the jobs were all bike riders and so at lunchtime they'd all go change into their little tidy spankies and jump on their bikes and you know did never fit into that not gonna happen um, has it held me back in my career maybe in a few small ways but overall I think you overcome it I think you prove yourself um, but there's always going to be a few individuals that maybe discriminate against it and you can't you can't help that some people have not evolved to the whole equality thing hope that made sense you know, work-life balance, because you've worked all along, all along, right? Well, my, our oldest child is 29, and I've got 25 years uh, in HR, so the first four years I actually taught dancing lessons after school, um, big difference than going to work in HR. It's, as a, as a mother, it is very, very hard when you have to miss a few of those special days at the kids' schools when they're going to be in some kind of a presentation or receive an award. And so my theory was always just to save my vacation days and use them for any kind of those family moments, those times you want to make sure you're there. One year, one of my daughters won what is called the Wellsville Mile. Five or six schools go to it. I didn't know it was such a big deal. It was her, my oldest child, her first year. Uh, I had no clue she was going to win it. <laughs> or else I would have been there. I just figured <laughs> hundreds of kids running around the block eight times, you know, why, why do I need to go be there? Because you only see them at the starting line and the finish line, right? No, she won. It was kind of a big deal, and I was at work. Uh, but I went to all the Wellsville Miles after that <laughs> for four more ki three more kids. That's when it hurts, is when you miss something. Uh, I was very fortunate to have someone I trusted with my kids. I didn't just have to drop them off kind of at a big depot area. Uh, I had a neighbor who was pers is a pers close personal friend, and I felt like they were raised as her own children were. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate that personally it wasn't as hard as it is for other people. My kids have actually managed very well. Um, one of my daughters uh, says, you know, I'm actually glad we got that extra experience. We got more social, we met more people, we learned to adapt, we learned to be a lot more independent. And so I do think my kids have gone through it just fine. A good question. Yes? What got you started out in HR? Why did you decide to go on that career path? It was an accident. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple different stories I could tell you here. Um, when I, my first real job as a married person was at Herf Jones doing yearbooks. I did the comp markup is what it was called which basically meant you took the text and you added the little codes that then somebody else typed into the computer like a slash R or a slash L, like when to space, when to indent, how many, to, you had to count how many down to go to make shapes in the text. It was before we had the word processing we have now, so I had to understand it from the backside. And um, when I interviewed there, I thought as I walked out, I thought, well, I want that lady's job. The lady that interviewed me, I thought that, that would be the fun job. You know, not, not the job I interviewed for. And so that's where the uh, 
that's where I first knew I wanted a job like that, but I did not know how you would get it. I did not know it was attainable, so I pretty much didn't worry about it. When I went to what was Morton at the time, you've heard of Morton Salt, uh, they had a, an automotive safety type division. Um, I got hired into that. It later became AutoLeave. You've probably heard of that one instead. When I went into the interview there, it was actually for a production position. My husband had just graduated from Utah State. He was changing jobs uh, to a more sales or commission-based job. He's an investment broker, and there's not a regular salary. It's kind of all over the board. And he said, you need to do something besides teaching dancing right now to, so we can have some benefits. I said, OK. Did not want to do it. Um, I actually, when they opened up the window of opportunity to get the applications, because they knew there'd be a huge rush because they were going to hire hundreds at the new auto leave in Brigham, um, I went to the, it was called Job Service at the time, the Department of Workforce Services, and it was crowded, and I'm in the parking lot, and I thought, I should just go home. I don't want to wait in line. I'm in a hurry. And then I thought, Ugh. but when I go home, he's going to ask me, and I can't lie. So I have to fill out the stupid application. <laughs> I have to do it. I was so compelled. And I got in line, and finally um, a lady came by, and I said, hey, do you have to fill it out here, or can you like take them home? And she says, well, you could take it home as long as you promise to bring it back tomorrow, because tomorrow it closes. Oh, OK, that's even better. She gives me one. I take it home, put it in my own little manual typewriter. You guys probably have never seen those. And uh, typed it all up, took it in first thing the next day. It was for a swing shift production line position. When I got into the interview, the guy said, wow, your application came to the top because you typed it. He says, people didn't do that. Plus, you were a valedictorian in your high school, and you have some college. He said, so we think you would be much better, much better employee than the people who don't have those things and didn't go to the extra effort. So I got in the A pile of resumes. When they had hundreds of uh, resumes or applications, they had the A, Bs, and the Cs. And the A's got brought in first. And he, just, he said, wow, you took this extra class at Utah State during the summer while you're not even a regular student, and you studied DOS and DBase and those old things you guys don't have to worry about. Wow, that's impressive. You should be in the office. You should work in the office with us. And this was the HR department, so that's how I ended up getting into HRs. Several lucky breaks. Yes, Jennifer. Um, you mentioned some of the conflicts that you've had, and I'm guessing that most of them are situational, but if you had to take anything as a whole on what, like how best to deal with conflict management and stuff, if there's anything in particular that was kind of consistent throughout all the conflicts you've dealt with. Conflicts between employees or between management or between, regarding me? The question was a, about handling conflict. That's a hard one. Um, when there's conflict between attorney uh, employees, you very clearly have to get both sides of the story. At one point, we had employees with restraining orders against each other because they were going through a divorce, and, and they both actually got very violent and threw things and stuff if they were around each other. They had tempers. And so that was very interesting, dealing with that kind of a conflict at work. We had to basically bring them in separately and say, here is the map of the facility. You park in this area. You use this door. You come to this side of the floor. OK, you work back in shipping. You park over here. You come in this way. You go here. Your lunch break is between these hours. Yours is between here. The, you know, we made sure they had a staggered lunch break. You use this set of restrooms. You use this set. So um, because they had not actually done anything at work, but we were aware of what was going on outside of work. And the restraining order is what made us actually have to take action. Other than that, we wouldn't have done anything about it. But the restraining order meant we did give uh, one of them, either of them, the opportunity to transfer to another facility, but neither one of them were willing to do so. People get very emotional about a lot of things. Um, there's another conflict. <laughs> I have been in a situation where I've had conflicts with my immediate supervisor. That is basically a no-win situation. Um, it typically ends up in you either transfer or, uh, or quit or get laid off. Um, I'm the kind of person that generally can work with about anybody, but I have actually encountered those one in a million type people that, have, how big was my network? You know, if that many people, I have, I've had two that I actually could not get along with. And a lot of that was because of the values, the ethical values. 
I basically told one boss at one point, when this ship goes down, I don't want to be a part of it. I, I need to get off. So you can help me or whatever, but I will be leaving. And so that's how I dealt with that conflict, conflict is just hold to your values. Okay, uh, HR is a peacemaker very often though when it comes to other people. Yes. So tell us about the day when you felt best about your job and the day when you felt the worst about your job. The question was the days that I felt best about my job and worst about my job. And I don't know, I can narrow it down to two specific days. Actually, yeah, the one worst day had to do with the one boss that um, early on in my career, as we both determined it was not going to be a good fit, and he sat me down and said very, very mean, very rude things. Uh, he didn't have anything specific on me. I have enough of a fight in me that I push back. I ask questions. I ask for uh, any data on it, and he did not have anything. He said he didn't have to. It was his opinion, and he was entitled to his opinion, and he just really dumped on me. So it was a management conflict was the worst day. Um, that is the only time that I have cried at work, um, but not in front of him. <laughs> not, till, um, not till I was alone did any tears actually escape. I was very emotional for actually several months. It was, it was that bad of an experience, and it really hurt my confidence. I transferred from that facility to another facility, and I did go from an HR manager at a small building to an HR supervisor at a very large building. My boss very quickly, um, well, she kind of knew me from before. It's not that huge of a company. Auto Leave got up to 6,800 at one time. It's the biggest that I know of. And uh, so it was between five and 6,000 at that time. And um, she, I basically got bored really easy. I, I says, I've done this, I've done this. I went out and did this. I've, you know, I did everything possible, worked long hours and said, I, give me something new, give me a problem, give me a challenge. And she continued to then give me additional workload until I <coughs> began to build my confidence back up. She gave me the whole security department. She said, why don't you put together like an emergency response team, all kinds of big, huge, extra things. So they put me in charge of the facilities as from the HR perspective. There's still a facility engineer in charge. But for some reason, I'm the person that got to set up the speed limit in the parking lots. I thought, wow, how many HR people get to say that they set up the speed limits in the parking lot? <laughs> Um, so that would be worst day stuff. There was also another, I'll give you another bad example. An employee was fired on a Friday afternoon and in the Sunday newspaper, and it wasn't me that did the termination. In the Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning newspaper, guess who was in the obituaries for self-inflicted? Yeah. Um, never do terminations on a Friday because people can't wake up the next morning and just go do something about it. There's something about Friday's just a little bit worse, not that that's the straw that broke the Campbell's back, but uh, that, that was also a very bad thing. Um, best days, that's a really, really, really hard one. It goes back to my personal motivation, personal um, motivators. Just when I am very s successful at putting together a policy, a, a process, just when I get to invent or fix or solve something. Mine's not as much the human part because I've, I've hired so many people that want to kiss me and hug me and I had a guy bring me a teddy bear and boxes of chocolates and, and to me that's not a big deal. I was just doing my job. But when you get to do something above and beyond that was kind of more dependent upon you, that you figured out, you solved it, that's my intrinsic motivator. Sorry, kind of a lame answer, but it's true. Yes. What kind of technical skills uh, would you like uh, the future of HR to, to have? I like that question. He asked about the technical skills of the future of HR. You need all those computer skills within your Microsoft and build onto that. You need to have um, HRIS skills, which generally transfer from your other, if you have the Microsoft suite, you can do about any kind of a HRIS, applicant tracking system, those kinds of, of softwares, the survey systems, things like that. But a, a part of the future of HR that I got involved with at Rio Tinto has to do with HR data, the metrics and the dashboards. I think that is 
um, an area that's just opening up and will continue to get bigger and better because as all the businessmen know, you need to have numbers. You need to compare. You need to show if you're growing or not. What gets measured gets improved, right, if it's visible. So HR more and more has to have the numbers, has to have a way to collect them, compile them, standardize them, and show them. So that's the direction I think it's going. Good question. Thank you Let's all. Give her a hand. <laughs> we appreciate that. We appreciate you so much uh, in just to telling us all about your career. It's been fascinating. Um, really appreciate it. I think we have a gift for you somewhere. And um, we do have a Oh, thanks. Okay, so those of you um, who are in my class, if you'll just hang around.